On behalf of the CIB student chapter at Western Sydney University and the Center for Smart Modern Construction, I extend a warm welcome to everybody who is joining us today from across the globe for our second fireside chat, Collective Sense Making. I also welcome Amir, my colleague. We are going to be rehearsed for tonight. Hi, Amir. Thanks, Priya. Today we have with us incredibly successful and high achieving professionals who are role models of thought, leadership, and entrepreneurial thinking. But before we start this exciting event, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we have gathered on today and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. With all respect. Without further ado, now I want to request Professor Sanat Pereira, the director of the Center for Smart Modern Construction, to welcome everybody and tell us a little bit more about the inspiration behind the collective sense making. Professor Nath Pereira, welcome in port. Thank you, Amir. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, invite you all and then welcome you all to this uh, collective sense making event, the second iteration of the collective sense making event. Uh, the uh, student chapter of the Western Sydney University of the CIB student chapter. This is the second event you are doing. And I know that uh, last August we had the Resilience Through Innovation uh, event, which was successfully concluded. And uh, it's, uh, it's really good to see how you are progressing and doing great things as we go along. COVID-19 has made us ever more resilient and harnessing the power of collective intelligence to create new value and experiences. The CIB student chapter and the Center for Smart Modern Construction have always been about non-traditional approaches and what better way to create value than collective sense making. I welcome our guests for tonight association, uh, tonight Associate Pro Professor Linda Taylor, uh, Pro-Vice uh, Pro Chancellor International at the Western Sydney University, and Natasha Munasinghe, uh, Director at Frank, who are uh, our uh, guest speakers uh, uh, who are going to talk to you all uh, on today's topic. We couldn't have had anybody better to speak on resilience through thought leadership. I wouldn't take much of your time and let the event begin. All the best. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for your welcome. It's indeed an honor to have with us today Associate Professor Linda Taylor, Pro Vice Chancellor, International Western Sydney University, a public policy expert with 20 years of experience working across industry, government, and the education sectors Linda brings, uh, Professor Linda brings a breadth of experience to the role. She worked in innovation and industry policy development and program delivery for the New South Wales government, led the Easy Access IP pilot program and brought cross-disciplinary research teams together with businesses to solve industry challenges. From 2007 to 2012, she managed the New South Wales government's India and Middle East desks building networks to attract investment to New South Wales. Her earlier roles include policy development in government and experience in not-for-profit and consulting sectors. In 2012, she received the prestigious Churchill Fellowship to research industry re research collaborations and commercialization in the context of Australia's innovation relationship with India. It's such an honor, Professor, to have you with us tonight and welcome to Collective Sense Making. Thanks, Priya, and uh, welcome on board again, Professor Linda. Our second guest tonight is Natasha Monasinghe. We are honored to have with us Natasha, the CEO of Frank, an education company that has trained over 100,000 people in employment skills. Natasha graduated in law from the University of Sydney and the Australian National University and recently became a full stack developer winning the Women of Technology Scholarship. She is the current president of the University of Sydney's Alumni Council to attend a hold of a global viewpoint considering she had lived in Asia 
uh, the specific, and now we are lucky to have her in Australia. And previously, she ran the Global Entrepreneurship Week campaign in Australia from 2012 to 2014. The campaign was officially supported by the Prime Minister Julia Gillard and honored by Barry O'Frail, with impact over 250,000 people around Australia. Welcome to our fireside. Uh, uh, Natasha, it's such a privilege to have you with us tonight. Welcome guests. Um, and it's now time to hear from you. So in Interchange 2020, which we will uh, talk about uh, in details later on, we met Linda and Natasha both. And I remember them saying, we might not all want to be entrepreneurs in the future, but all jobs of the future will need us to think like entrepreneurs. So today we have Associated Professor Linda Taylor speaking to us on why it's necessary to think like entrepreneurs. Professor Linda, the board for you. Professor Linda. You're on mute. Okay, that's better. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's a, um, a real pleasure to be part of your event tonight and I I think uh, it's a really exciting topic and very important. Um, what I want to do is set the scene around COVID-19 and then explore some of the opportunities for a university that does embrace an entrepreneurial mindset. So let's look at the scene. Um, COVID-19 has actually accelerated us, universities and others, to a tipping point. Uh, many of the things here were actually set in motion before COVID-19, but things are moving very fast. We've got the challenges of uh, the pandemic, the health challenges. We don't know when the borders will open. All of the economic impacts of that, we're facing now a depression of the century. What's the capacity of our markets going to be to pay for an international education in Australia? We need to rethink um, because we, uh, it's quite possible that students and their parents will be rethinking the value proposition of international education. Fundamental questions pushing us into uh, new ways of approaching uh, what international education is. We're also seeing overseas institutions, uh, the quality improving all the time and students will choose to stay at home. Those source countries like China and others will actually become competitors as they attract students from many of our markets. Lay over the top of that the geopolitics uh, the challenges, particularly in our relationship with China, China being by far the largest market for the Australian education. What that means is that we have um, increasing costs of recruitment as we compete in market for um, a diminishing pool of students. Uh, and, and those costs are resulting in decreased margins. So the pressure on universities around recruitment and revenue is intense. All right. If we take the broader picture, so I've talked about the COVID tipping point, but I actually think we're in a perfect storm. It's more than that. Universities have had a 500 year monopoly on the degree, the only universally recognized validation of skills based on the face-to-face -face delivery on campus. So what do we have now? Google announced the digital garage, free learning content to jumpstart your career. Learn from Google experts, flexible, fully online, get a certificate. Ernst & Young, for example, have got degree apprenticeships. So watch this space. When employers recognize these credentials, the game will change. I think it's time for us to reconsider our value proposition. We need to start thinking like entrepreneurs. I'm going to look at two things, our current product, our current markets and business models, and innovation in new products and markets and business models. And I'm going to use what's the touchstone for entrepreneurs, product market fit, the lean startup methodology, uh, hypothesis, test, prove, build, measure, test, iterate. Um, that value hypothesis is defining what the product is, who's desperate for the product, and what's the business model to deliver it. So higher education has had what, who, and how beyond question, no challenges, 
but all aspects of that are up for grabs. All right, so if I look at our current products and market and business model in relation to the product market fit, let's think about what. What's the product? Onshore, face-to-face, -face, full degrees as a pathway to jobs. And that's what we're delivering. 25 out of our 30 courses have professional accreditation. That's why students come to us. It's gonna be important into the future. It will always contribute to our revenue, but we need to start to challenge our assumptions and the processes underlying that value proposition. It's the who, our students. They want a course that will lead to a job in a good university that's not too expensive. And let's be frank, for many of them, a pathway to PR. We are attracting students from families with incomes that can afford $100,000 for an education in Australia, plus living costs. So we're targeting about the top 3% income bracket in our source markets. How are we delivering? Mostly digital, but still a lot of face-to-face -face marketing and agent-based recruitment. What's the disruption that's around the corner there? You know, what sits ahead of agent-based recruitment and face-to-face -face marketing? Going into agents' offices, meeting with students. At what point will we see a transition to peer-to-peer -to -peer marketing, social media and network effect marketing? All of those things that have transformed industries before international education. Let's watch this space. I think we're going to see real challenges to some of the um, fundamentals around what, who and how of our traditional market and product. At the moment, how do I know if we've got product market fit? That the product sells or it doesn't? We've had products that have fallen, products, courses, um, master of engineering, something like 50% drop. I can't tell whether it's something happening in market. I don't have the feedback loops. What would a startup do? A startup would be right in there talking to the students. Um, you know, there's a story about Airbnb when they weren't uh, in New York where, this, where their um, clients were. They were sitting in San Francisco having a, a chat to their mentor and he said, what are you doing here? Go where your market is. Get on a plane to New York. And they went door knocking on the Airbnb first clients. That's what a startup would do in this situation. Where is our leak, weakest link? How, who is desperate for our courses and how do we know? Okay, I wanna look at the second uh, element of this. It's not just what we currently deliver, our onshore courses, $100,000. It's also what COVID has propelled, a wave of product and market innovation. The what? Online, hybrid, high flex, amazing transformation very agile, everybody had no choice but to move very, very quickly online. And that leads us into micro-credentials and disaggregated courses. Um, this is gonna be driven by technology, so the product will continually evolve. Zoom enabled is where we are now, synchronous or asynchronous, but AI is gonna sit behind our online delivery. So you'll have adaptive learning that continually evolves um, in response to the students' learning patterns. Um, AR, VR, blockchain, there is a wave of innovation coming through. I wanna talk just a little bit about the, um, some of the ways in which we have actually thought like entrepreneurs in relation to our onshore um, courses. We have gone out to students with a voice of student feedback on delivery. We're setting up some uh, virtual lab pilots. Um, we're getting students to nominate online teaching uh, that's had an impact on the quality of their learning experience. We're piloting new delivery with hypothesis, hypothesis test prove iterations. We've got a number of high flex pilots in development now. Um, the college delivered 10 online courses under federal government funding um, which they developed in five weeks. Under normal circumstances, we would not get that through our approval processes in five months. So here are some green shoots of thinking like an entrepreneur, of moving at the pace of an entrepreneur. And these are important because I'd say they're incremental, but they're sitting in the mainstream of the university 
And that's part of what you need to do in order to have the entrepreneurial mindset become part of how we operate and the pace at which we move. The big game changer though, the one that I find most exciting is around who. So now we've got uh, the product that allows us to live, uh, deliver online, flexibly, micro-credentialed, offshore and onshore. It means that we have the potential to reach a completely new market. If we're talking about the $100,000 degree, we're reaching about three, you know, parents who are sitting in the top 3% of income bracket in our source markets. We can now aspire to reach the top 20% if we can find the product and the price point to reach a broader audience. And if we're going to do that, we're in a very different space. And I think it's time for design thinking. You would want to be thinking about um, how we really understand our users' needs. We're, it's not the, same, not the same user that we've had. The student cohort is completely different. So we need to be looking um, in a human-centered design with human-centered design processes, putting our assumptions aside, yes, using data, um, but looking at what might that new market be that's technology enabled and what are the new business models that will get us out there. We want to define our users' needs and problems. A problem statement would become essential here. And, you know, not time yet, but my go at this is international education is reaching a small proportion of those that could benefit from it. How can we cost effectively deliver at scale, transform lives and generate revenue? What personas would we use to keep it human centered? I find that a very exciting space for us to be moving into. And we can't do it unless we think like entrepreneurs. So here we have the drivers, global challenges. We need to diversify revenue. We have technology enabled innovation. It calls for new ways of thinking and working and collaborating. How ambitious can we be in imagining a truly global university? It's hard right now, but what's on the other side of recruitment and revenue? What's our bigger purpose? If we have a global vision for a university committed to transforming lives through education, we will need to think like entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I personally, I'm thrilled to hear you speak and I feel motivated and inspired and so happy that we think alike. Thank you so much for your talk, Professor. And we have received uh, one or two questions that uh, we, we will ask you now. Um, uh, the first one is from a student's perspective, be it undergrad, postgrad, or even a doctoral researcher. What's that starting point to general thinking, you know, to get there, especially if you're an international student, you know? So what's that starting point? Um, I think the university is actually um, in a very good position to provide a starting point for um, students to begin to think like entrepreneurs. So there's a couple of things. One is that um, we have Launchpad, which is our um, startup hub, uh, and we do have a course in entrepreneurship. But if I was putting those to one side, because they're kind of the, the structural organisational elements, um, Thinking like an entrepreneur for someone coming into an undergrad or postgrad, I would say that the starting point is what's the problem you want to solve? Uh, you know, it doesn't, you don't start with technology, you start with a really um, deep understanding of a problem you want to solve. And if you've got that, um, the rest will follow. Uh, and of course, there'll be all of the kind of, uh, you know, the iterations, and it might not be the first problem that you actually get off the ground, but. Um, you start with the problem. I cannot agree more uh, with the Professor Linda, but before I like to go, because I have another question, uh, Professor Linda actually uh, mentioned uh, like about technology and one of uh, my favorite technologies is blockchain. And uh, we have the big fan for blockchain, Professor Sanat Pereira, because in our center, we are like uh, running uh, five PhD projects regarding blockchain. So, block so Professor Nath can, I mean, apart from 
the design thinking, like from technology perspective. Can you tell us like more about blockchain? Because I believe like we have a lot of audience from a uh, construction industry and even te I mean technology industry. And after, after that, I will back to you, uh, Professor Linda, because I have a question. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm so thrilled to hear that you've got uh, research happening in your school around blockchain, because uh, actually I said to Simeon, uh, Simoff the other day, uh, we need to get together and talk about blockchain because it's such an important technology for the university. Um, look, there's a couple of things. One is to say that um, uh, it's not new. Uh, and it's in 2014, um, the King's College in New York was the first accredited US, US institution um, using Bitcoin. So there's that, you know, that goes back quite a while. Um, Lucerne University of Applied Arts and Sciences in Switzerland is also researching Bitcoin. There's a university that we've had some um, uh, dealings with in Vietnam, FPT also using that. And there's a university called Wolfwood University, which was founded by a group of academics in Oxford and Cambridge that's relying on blockchain and smart contracts as the basis of the relationship between learners and educators. Um, I'm interested in achievements. So the efficiencies associated with having a technology like that reduces CV fraud, reduces your overheads in relation to credential verification, streamlines transfers between students for students between universities, and most importantly for me, sets up the opportunity for us to establish a global network of universities where you can take your um, credits, uh, uh, blockchain virtual transcripts from one university to another. Now, if you've got a team of um, people working in blockchain, they've probably got a whole lot of other ideas about um, how it might be relevant to higher education, and I would love to meet with them. It's not kind of I, art, like, uh, uh, I think uh, 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 Amir raised a very valuable question there, and uh, uh, Linda, you pretty much, uh, uh, um, I don't have to tell about blockchain, you have uh, already touched on the benefits of blockchain in an educational context. You have done the homework there very well. Uh, so, but now we need to make it happen. Exactly. Okay. We have all the capabilities and uh, uh, possibly we are happy to show you a prototype that we developed recently uh, that was targeting the property market. Uh, Ame and a few others were involved in developing that. and. Uh, we can sh show you the potential there and, uh, and definitely it can be applied to, for specifically for micro-credentialing. Yes. And that's yes. something that uh, university is thinking uh, quite a lot about mm -hmm. and the transportability and uh, trustworthy uh, exchange of credits is an extremely valuable aspect mm -hmm. in using blockchain in managing educational aspects. I, I heard something about Melbourne using uh, or their trialing or something like that. Yes, I, I've heard that too. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely starting. I think Deakin maybe as well, but I also heard Melbourne. So uh, we need to get started. Let's make it a, uh, we'll get together. <laughs> yes, exactly. Very happy to uh, uh, collaborate on that and Wonderful. we can make it happen. Okay, very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Linda. Thank you, Professor Sernath. I usually say I am like glad and happy that I'm part of Center for Smart Modern Construction and Western Sydney University. But I'm also so happy because up next we have Natasha. Natasha will discuss how to use design thinking approach to build your career. She will draw upon both the mindset and skill set of design thinker to create the ultimate start of your career. We listened to Natasha during Interchange 2020, and I can assure you she's an amazing speaker. Natasha, you are on board. <laughs> what did I say, Amer, about keeping the threshold very low? <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, always difficult following a good speaker. Uh, so Linda, you know, keeps it keeps the standards up. But I'm very happy that even in the midst of COVID, we are still optimistic. Uh, and still motivated, you know, I think that's the one of the important things to hold on to. So I'm actually going to be using a slide deck. So excuse me while I just bring that up a moment. Okay. Um, I think we've gone through all the bio stuff. Only the only thing I would add is I would love to hear from you. So please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. 
I'm talking about a topic I love, which means I'm probably going to go over time. <laughs> um, but if you have any questions, put them on chat, uh, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn at any point. In the, in the few minutes I have with you, I guess a couple of things in terms of design thinking for, the career, for your career is really applying um, a lot of things that Linda talked about, which is amazing. And I'm going to try to keep it very practical and share uh, things that I hope you can do straight after this session. Don't try to do everything, but if there's one key action you can do, you know, that's a win. Um, I'm going to talk through why I think now is the time to really take charge of our being our own CEO of your own career, what that looks like. Um, this idea of a mindset of a designer, which is one of permanent beta, so I'll talk, talk through that. The two key design mindsets, there are a few different ways of doing it, but there's two, I think, in the time that I want to talk to you about. One is, as Linda talked about, really figuring out the problem you're going to solve. That really is almost half the work. And then have a bias towards action. Go try stuff, go do stuff, learn, get feedback and repeat. That's the process. Finally, in terms of skills, and we know we talk about relearning, staying, um, staying relevant. I have kind of like two approaches to skills building, which I find and I apply, find really helpful. One I call the Big Bang Theory and the other one's called the Lynn Chocolate Approach. I'll talk through those two and you, you decide which one works for you. Okay, so the challenge is when I say, you know, be the CEO of your own career, what I mean fundamentally about that is drive your own opportunities, look to create it. I am really inherently positive about where we are. It's chaos right now, but I actually think there's more opportunity for all of us uh, to actually do stuff and to thrive and more doors are open. The reason I also say that we need to drive in and be, uh, you know, our, our CEO is that the world of work, there's lots of things going on. There's lots of not only changes, but restructuring happening. So just in terms of facts, we spend a chunk of our time, our life working, right? Anywhere between 75,000 to 100,000 hours, that's just off a 40 year work life. If you're doing anything more than a standard week over 40 years, you're probably inching towards the higher end of that. That's a significant chunk of your life, right? Yet, if we look at a lot of the um, surveys around people being happy at what they do, uh, the job being what they're looking for, there's a significant number. So Gallup said about 85% of people globally um, aren't really happy in, in their jobs they do. So you're spending a lot of your life doing this, but you're not really happy. So there's something, there's some actions you need to take to kind of make sure you're not one of those statistics. In terms of COVID, some of the changes that have been accelerated is now a lot of organizations to save money, essentially, are uh, going and cutting down on things like full-time employment and picking up on contract workers and freelancers. Now, this trend was already happening. So before COVID, the US in sort of seven years or so was heading to majority of their workers being freelancers and contract workers, right? COVID, I think it just pushed, made, that, made these changes quicker. And in terms of the average, average length of a, a gig or a contract, it's about, you know, I'm just under five months. Now, these aren't like abstract theoretical concepts, right? Imagine if this is the future you're walking into, where your career is a, a few different contracts, maybe short term. How do you make that work for you? How do you make sure there are new opportunities awaiting you? And, and more importantly, not just surviving, how do you thrive in this? I think those are the questions you want to be asking and preparing for. That's the world of work. In terms of how we start navigating it, um, you know, Reid Othman, who is a founder, one of the founders of LinkedIn, he says when it comes to startups and when it comes to your career, you know, have a uh, permanent beta mindset. And what I mean by that is treat your career as a work in progress. There's no end goal. The F word is finished. There is no finished. <laughs> um, and from the startup world, you know, if you think of the, how they approach this idea of permanent beta, Google launched, so Gmail launched in 2014. They, you know, got out of this uh, testing development phase in 2009 after they had millions of users. Even though they had their first million, their second million, they were still learning and tweaking and they still were nowhere near finished. If you think of Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos, from the time he started, he has a letter he sends to his shareholders. From the time he started, he says it's still day one of the internet and day one of Amazon.com. So yes, be optimistic, but be vigilant. And that mindset of just uh, having that work in progress, making sure that things aren't finished, for me, actually what it does, it, it helps combat overwhelm. 
And the reason, I, you know, it personally helps me combat overwhelm is that if you're always looking outside, so let's say you look at your LinkedIn feed, it seems that everyone's doing some wonderful things, right? And it's easy to get caught up in a bit of a thinking that you're not doing enough, that it's never going to be enough. And I think if you get into that mindset, uh, that consumes a lot of energy. That's just a negative cycle. You kind of need to accept where you are and, and, and start there. So as, as a design thinker, you are not trying to create a false reality. You are really, really accepting the reality as it is and then thinking, what are the small steps I can do to achieve this big goal? But let me, let me start where I'm at. Also in permanent beta, because things are never finished, you are really, as a byproduct, always learning, always tweaking. Some things are going to work, some things are not. Things are going to fail, some things are, not, you know, some things are really going to succeed. That's part of the process. As a, as a design thinker, you're not thinking really your way forward as much as you are building your way forward. So accept your reality. The main bit I'm going to talk about now is idea of reframing the problem you're looking at. So a career problem, um, a job problem then what's the bias? What's the prototype action I can take? And then how do I learn from it? So let me go through that process now. And I'm going to try to keep it as practical as I can. So in terms of reframing the problem, so in, in Interchange, we introduced this idea of problem really, really early on. And we told the participants, you're probably going to spend a lot of time figuring out what you're actually trying to do. A lot of us may, when it comes to our careers, actually be asking the wrong questions. And we could be spending months, days, years trying to actually answer a question uh, and try to get a solution that actually does not work for us. So you want to really be very clear on this reframing your problem <clears throat> and put the problem in a box. And what I mean by that is when you put in a box, there'll be some things that are included and some things that are excluded. So I, I'm talking to a student audience mostly. So a, 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 like a problem I always get, people, you know, students come and talk to me about is, I need to land a graduate job. And normally it's a graduate job at a you know, very prestigious firm, right? Or organization. And that is a legitimate problem statement. But I think one of the other, one, other ways of looking at getting a job is you could probably ask questions like, how might I find a role in whatever field it is that helps me learn in demand skills? How might I get experience working in an organization with lots of responsibilities so you grow quickly? How might I get a job where I'm challenged quickly or work with some really smart mentors? The moment you start, you know, really opening up your problem statement, you'll find actually your um, opportunities, your new possibilities also start opening up. And the reason is if let's say going back to your problem statement, which is the graduate job, if that's the only way you're looking at something, that's the prism, then all the other things that fall outside it, you're not even going to be looking at that because it doesn't fall into this graduate job box. So really spend time with that reframing problem, particularly in the, in the space of a career. When it comes to thinking of problems, you also want to avoid something called this anchor problem. So the anchor problem is essentially where your solution is built into the problem and you can't escape it, right? So let me again, just for examples, because it makes, makes sense. Let's say I want to do, what I would love to do is I want to go sailing and I want to go sailing every weekend because I love it so much but I can't afford a boat, too expensive, 50 grand, 100 grand, way, way, too, way over budget, right? Now, if I was wanting to do that, one of the, the trap is when I'm trying to solve a problem, it could be, how do I go and get a boat when I don't have money? And your anchor then that I don't have money, uh, that'll inform your solutions. You might think, oh, I need to go save, or it might be years before I can get a boat. And that's the path you go down. A better reframe of your problem to achieve what you really want, which is to go sailing every weekend, is how can I go sailing regularly with my limited budget? So you've not acknowledged the reality that you don't have the cash right now, but you still want to go do something. So then when you're looking at it that way, you might have a whole bunch of new possibilities open up, right? So I can join a volunteer crew, join a sail club. I can go and um, volunteer at events at the York Club during Christmas or whatever. And you'll find that as you go and take those steps, you probably will end up with some parts to go and getting this boat, which you want to do at some point. But if you're only looking at the, how do I buy a boat problem, you probably won't try those other things, which might actually get you where you want, right? So I hope that's kind of uh, giving you a little bit of clarity around this whole idea of problem. The second thing is once you are very confident, yeah, this is exactly what the problem I'm trying to solve. Okay, let's go now make this happen, right? Let's go try stuff, let's be curious. 
I'm not going to spend too long on this idea of goals, but um, a really great source of goals is a, a Professor BJ Fogg at Stanford University. So one of the Instagram founders was a uh, student of his, and he talks through how he's got a three-step routine to creating habits, which sounds super simple, uh, but actually really works. And that's how I learned how to floss <laughs> consistently was um, following his three-step routine. So when you have these goals into place, trying stuff, instead of going and doing something really big, break everything down to the micro goals. So if you want to achieve a mar you know, run a marathon, you want to break it up over eight weeks or um, eight, you know, eight months, how long it's going to take you and make it so easy that it's all doable and follow that consistently. So that's the process of how you achieve these long goals. And even if you get 70% of, of an achievement, consider that a win uh, in terms of goal theory, right? So keep this in mind, but the Professor B.J. Fox, probably the best, best source on how the theory works. Uh, in terms of prototyping also, when you're getting into action, particularly in the job space these days, allow, to, allow for you know, time for things to, to actually work for you. So if you're going and applying just for res resumes, you might have to do a bunch of other things also to get to this job. It's not gonna happen over, overnight. And that's the other thing as a, probably as a student audience, uh, that's the reality be okay with it and learn how to thrive and make that work in your favor. I wanna show you again, using an example, what prototyping real life looks like in your career, right? So I, I, you know, we work a lot with students and one of the common fields students wanna get into these days seems to be around consulting. Um, and I, so if a student comes up and says, I wanna be, you know, get into the consulting field, uh, you know, you, you're going, you do the normal process, which is you apply for resumes and applications and things like that. But as a design thinker, you want to think, what are the other ways I can go and find out more about this consulting field? So the first thing is going and talking to people who are consultants. So reaching out through your networks, through LinkedIn, and really getting uh, firsthand information from people who are doing it, what the world of work of consulting is like. You're not asking for a job. This is nothing to do with the job. This is part of your research, right? So tell me the day-to-day -day of a consultant. What do you love? What do you hate? Um, who gets, you know, who gets, uh, who gets, what do you do with the clients? What skills do I need? All these things, really, really great information for you that when you get into that job hunting process, now you know what the inside is. Let's say you've spoken to a couple of consultants and then you figure out, okay, well, this is, you know, the most important thing, blockchain. Blockchain consultants are really, really sought after, all right? So now you know that. Maybe you know you have some blockchain experience because you've been part of the center um, and then you want to create a bit of a pitch for yourself. Is it compelling? This is what stands you apart from the other, you know, thousand students that are applying for this position. Is it compelling? If you have that and you're confident with that, then find a, you know, a platform. And this is where the gig economy will really, really help you. There are lots of platforms like Upwork, Freelancer, where you can actually pitch yourself as a consultant on a project you know, do really good work, get a review, and that starts your career process, right? So you might still end up in the consulting field, but you've already started taking these actions as well as putting your resume in. So a lot of people put the resume in and then wait, and that's one approach. This is another approach to get into what you want using small micro actions. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the two things on prototyping, reframing and prototyping, getting to action. Final thing is really about you want to build some skills. Like how does it start? Um, two, two things that I kind of, that helps me. One is, is the big bang theory. And what I say about big bang is you start from where you're at and then you expand outwards, right? So you start with your current set of skills and then you pick skills that are kind of near uh, on the edge of what you do. It, one, it reinforces your current knowledge and two, it actually might lead to faster skills acquisition. So let me give you again some examples of what this may look like. So let's say you're studying or working in marketing. An adjacent skill for you may be psychology. You're trying to understand people. How do people make decisions? How do you, you know, sell or communicate to that? How do you change people's minds? That could be an expansion outside marketing. Let's say you're good at communication. You might find that you easily kind of pick up email marketing, which is now a very sought after skill in the tech space. If you're really good at writing, you might find actually the same principles apply for SEO. You need to know about keywords, how to structure documents, 
same thing is very useful in, in the world of search, uh, search engine optimization, SEO. Again, very, very sought after skill. So think about yourself in terms of an inventory of where you're at, your current set of skills. And then if you were to expand out, what are some of that next layer that you could reach out to? And you might have, you know, you might have many. You can choose the one that you're curious about, or you can look at the market and go, you know, what's actually, uh, what's in demand right now that if I were to stretch myself, I would actually make myself competitive. So big bang theory. The second one, which uh, you can go choose, you don't have to go hand in hand, is like what I call the Lind approach. And I say Lind because if you look at, you know, lots of chocolates these days, you have, you have this, used to have the, only the standard chocolate, right? But now it's mixed up with a lot of things. So you have chocolate, chili, you have salt and caramel and, and chocolate, all mixed. And sometimes it's, these seems like very unlikely mixtures. And that's kind of what I want you to think in terms of if you're wanting to stand out, to be different, to be memorable, to be, for people to notice you, think of a skill set that you can pick up that is completely different from what you're doing and go and, and pick it up or learn it or do an online course. So if you're doing accounting, is there, is there a course or an online session about landscaping that you could do? Completely go out, right? And the reason is at the moment you do that, you give yourself a position that is unique, that is different, that everyone else coming through, for instance, probably unlikely will have that combination. And by choosing something that's very different, you've carved your niche, you carved your uniqueness. It doesn't mean you need to go and do anything career-wise with landscaping. I mean, you might pick different ways of thinking, but it's just uh, a way to position yourself and be unique in what is now a very, very crowded marketplace. So you could choose Big Bang as a way to go in terms of your skids development, or you could choose the Lynn chocolate approach, right? So the um, final thing is just as a design, as a designer, uh, design thinker, you want to you know, harness creativity, right? And it has, no, it has nothing to do with career or a job. It's just the way of being. Here are come, you know, just some actions you could take if you are in the space where you think, I want to become more curious. I want to know what this whole curiosity thing about is about. So one is leave some time for a randomness. Uh, sometimes we're too planned, too structured. We want to actually leave times where things are open. You might also do something different, use different bits of your brain. If you're always listening to the same playlist on your phone, listen to a different playlist. You know, if you always walk the same way to work or to uni, take a different path. Um, you know, read a different book that you've got a completely different subject matter, completely unfamiliar to you. Look at the people who are doing lots of amazing things, who are like the hubs, and go arrange a time to meet up with them and see how they see the world. Why are they the hubs for opportunity? What's going on? How are they talking to people? Is there something going on with them that you can learn from? If you want to learn about trends, ask see who, which of your friends are the early adopters, the ones that always are getting, you know, learning about the newest thing coming. How, what are they doing? Are they subscribing to some magazines? Are they picking up this information from somewhere? Learn from them. Um, if you know someone who's curious, ask them out for lunch. Again, jumping into their world. What are the questions they're asking? Why are they coming across as so curious? Why are they doing all these random things? These are things just in general, if you wanna expand and build out curiosity and see what this curiosity thing is about, uh, start doing. And I know, for instance, taking different routes to work. I do that. I mix up my playlists. Um, I, try to learn, I try to learn from the most networked person because I'm like, I'm fairly introverted naturally. So how is this person the, the hub of the party? Why do they know everybody? So those are things I definitely don't naturally have to do, but I have to program myself to do so I can sort of open up my mind and build and, and get this curiosity into practical action because that's very much what I'm very passionate about is not the theory so much as in let's go and do the work and get the results from doing the work. So I think that brings me to the end. Yes, um, please definitely connect me with me on LinkedIn. I hope at least one of these things was of value or some of these tips were of value to you. That is a pre-COVID haircut also. <laughs> things have changed. Um, but thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you so much, Natasha. What an interesting presentation.
And uh, we've been getting interesting questions from the audience as well, given uh, how interesting uh, the presentations have been. So we will take a very interesting question from Rafael, who is a, a student uh, of uh, maybe his final year at Western Sydney University, a very young and enthusiastic lad. And so he has uh, asked a question, how do you see uh, the university student changing their mindset when there is so much data becoming available to the individual and there is no clear distinction between a university degree compared to someone learning the same content online? What would be the entrepreneurial mindset for someone trying to push further in the design and construction industry? Um, Professor Linda had already uh, taken the question um, in the chat, but it's only to the panelists. So I will try to post her answer to all the attendees as well. And I would also invite Professor Srinath or Professor Linda and Natasha to take this question and give your comments on that. Thank you. Um, look, I'm happy to just um, kick, kick this off, but I'm sure others would want to contribute. Um, look, I think it's a really interesting question. And of course, when um, courses are available online, some of them free, um, you can ask yourself, why am I paying for a university degree? Well, I think you've got to look at um, what is it that you get from coming to university that you will not get on an online course. And for me, there should be, um, you know, a richness and a breadth of experience that's not just about content. Content, you can get it anywhere. So what is it that a university experience brings that is beyond content? And for me, it's around um, the things that I put in the chat, um, your networks and your friendships the um, experiential learning. So I'm sure that in design and construction, it's about what you do as well as what you learn um, in terms of content. It's about testing your ideas. It's about expanding your um, view, view of the world. Uh, it's all of that kind of rich engagement. And um, I think that uh, universities need to position themselves this way. We are now in, in competition with, uh, potentially in competition with good online courses. But we have a value proposition, and I think this is, you know, to your point, um, the value proposition is that you get exposure face to face, you get the um, high, hybrid high tech um, online course, which you might not get with a straight um, MOOC or something like that. Uh, and really, the university, I would think, is in a position to offer you a rich experience around face to face networks, friendships, practical learning. Um, challenging your mind, challenging your point of view, challenging what you learn. Content's not just what you pick up, it's what you do with it. And good lecturers and good universities are continually engaging, not just with the content, but with the students and how they respond to the content. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a great question, but I feel passionately that there's more to learning than content. Now, now, thank you, Professor Linda. Natasha, your take on that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so yeah, I would absolutely agree, Raphael, on um, sort of the trend where things are going. I know when I was deciding which uh, course, software development course to do, I actually went and sat in on all orientation sessions for each of the different coding schools. I talked to tech uh, employers to find out which skills were in demand, if they, you know, how they were rated. So I did all that research that which then informed me of the course that I wanted. Um, I think the, the, this, the advantage that universities or an education organization will give you is employers, the technical skills are required, but employers really high on some of those people skills, you know, how do you work with teams, how do you uh, communicate, um, how you build relationships, so universities, your university learning uh, should really give you so much experience you know, on how to thrive in those environments. Um, and so that's why I always say group assignments, team assignments are probably the best experience for the real world. In the world of work, you're going to be, you're going to be doing work and learning uh, and sort of meeting goals with other people. We use technology to get there, to achieve things. But at the end of the day, you're working with people. So how, how do you develop those skills? How do you get the feedback you need? How do you know uh, where you, know, you need to grow your strengths? How do you learn about emo emotional intelligence? How do you know about getting feedback, giving feedback? Um, when people leave jobs, they don't leave jobs. Uh, they leave jobs, the most given reason is they don't get along with their manager. Uh, that's a people to people relationship. So I would use our, the university experience to really hone down, hone in on those skills. Um, the content is important, but it's those skills I think are really critical. 
That's great, Thank you, Natasha. And now I'd like to ask Professor Srinath if he could add in brief about this question. Yes, Sarah. Uh, I think a lot of things were covered, but I would like to bring an important aspect in uh, uh, learning in university. Uh, first of all, to uh, understand what is university. University means learning to live in the universe, in, in the universe around us. So how to live in the society. That's what university provides everybody because we interact, live in a society and know how to get on or not get on with people. And, and those tensions and those experiences make our whole understanding of living in the society. Now that's the broader context, but in a very specific side, uh, I say peer learning as an important aspect in uh, university education. I teach in the masters in project management, uh, predominantly adult students, and we create a setting where students can learn from each other. They talk to each other. More than they learn from us, they learn from each other in that process. But we facilitate that and we provide the environment and provide the catalyst that is needed to grow that knowledge and the debate, discussion, to progress. So that is what university education will provide, which Google will not be able to provide. And uh, uh, Google and uh, Harvard, open source learning, all of those were from all, uh, talked about a few years back and for the last decade or so. And everybody was saying, oh, that will be the death of the university system. Here we are still and strong and stronger than ever before facing COVID and similar situations. I don't think that's ever going to be the case. Uh, as such, for the universities, there is enormous amount to learn and enjoy in a university environment. Students are, at the moment, uh, restricted university access because of the uh, COVID situation. They are demanding, can, when can we come in? We want to have more in, in, and we want to have that full experience. And, and that, that is very much so because they, they need that because that's the university education and that's what you will talk about to your rest of your life. Most, for most of you, the best part of your life is the time you spent in your university. So that's, uh, uh, I still talk with my mates about what we did in the university, have a laugh about it and things like that and who called the other what and all kinds of things. That's what we do. And that's the society, we, we enjoy that. Thank you, Professor Srinath. And I must mention that this is exactly what we experience as a part of Center for Smart Modern Construction at Western Sydney University as well. We enjoy the peer experience of research, which is pretty much different from anybody doing research alone. So thank you so much, panel panelists and speakers. But now we move on to the second uh, half of today's um, uh, webinar. If we are a tad bit over time, just excuse us because the speakers are really amazing today. So um, the idea of collective sense making originated because Amer and me, both of us, we have participated in several events in Australia, the MENA region, the UK and India, where we have applied design thinking for structured innovation. Uh, Amer is my co-host for uh, Collective Sense Making, and you all know him, but it's time I formally introduce him as a, a speaker and guest for tonight. He's a researcher at the Center for Smart Modern Construction at Western Sydney University, working on BIM and blockchain. He has completed Oxford's blockchain strategy program and holds a master's in building information modeling from UE Bristol. He is also an entrepreneur and has officially registered his startup in the UK and is working to make BIM business as usual. So today he will be talking to us about his design thinking experience at Interchange 2020. So you're on board, Amer, and let me share your slides. Thank you, uh, thank you, Priya. It, it's, it's totally different to speak as a guest. <laughs> 2020 is a study with Western Sydney uh, a University Partner Project in collaboration with seven outstanding universities. 300 international and local students have one-of-a-kind platform 
of a theoretical and practical employability learning where they can establish on extend both their uh, I mean, uh, uh, local and uh, international networks. Over five weeks, uh, inter-university uh, teams create a simulated startup identifying and addressing real life problems facing humanity and our like especially our uh, uh, problem here in Australia, even uh, abroad. The student teams are supported and monitored by professional industry experts. Students work virtually learning and applying the latest technology tools. And actually, um, I'm happy that this, uh, this uh, event was powered by Frank and with a high uh, uh, partnership with Western Sydney University. My idea on a smart city was shortlisted as the one of the top five ideas out of 42 submissions for Interchange 2020. Our value proposition was to change people's perception of traveling in Sydney by creating a more enjoyable experience for their journey. We may not be able to change the infrastructure or able new policies or regulation, but our application, Your Way, is a mobile application that helps to identify the best personalized route to reach their destination. That's interesting. So uh, what was your biggest takeaway from this design thinking experience? Nice question. Uh, the first point uh, is about design thinking team should ideally be a cross-disciplinary team. And I believe the panelists have uh, mentioned that because the mix between specialists, including specialized association with a problem area contributing but not dominating, uh, dominating the journey. I believe while specialists may have vast knowledge on the technical level, they are also working towards solution targeting target non-specialist people in many areas cases and require outside the perspective in addition to what they already know. Br bringing together teams that provide a wider view of things is I think is important, but even more so is to encourage team to look out their own cycle of influence to allow more holistic firm problems to be uncovered. The second point, I believe it's important build the right team culture. If we apply the analogy of design thinking as a journey, having a good travel partners is important to safely and successfully arriving at your desired destination. So choosing the perfect team may not always be possible, especially in a situation where there is a limited of pool candidate. Within start needs to be involved in everything. So it may be more of a case of developing the appropriate team culture or even a project culture in order to move forward with the design thinking. Encourage empathy, experimentation, curiosity, courage, open mindset, holistic thinking, and stripping away biases, I believe are the great places to start. The third point, which is I need to share with you the importance of a good facilitator. Having a leader uh, to spread the mission uh, is important as there is always a tendency from the uh, members to resort to uh, familiar patterns, which may not suit with the needs of the design thinking. Hierarchies might sit quickly and uh, management styles may subvert the mission. So a leader who exper experience with maintaining the right mix of mindset is essential in design thinking. An ideal leader is someone who can maintain high level of energy and passion, someone who can steer the group around obstacles, and someone who has at least some grounding in running design thinking or a similar project. So I believe in conclusion, the design thinking team or the process is about trust and thought leadership. The process of design thinking takes you into unknown and sometimes uncomfortable territory. Members of design thinking team need to be open-minded, curious, collaborative, and allow for their assumption to be challenged, ready, uh, ready for change and adaptable, I mean, in different areas. Yes, that's a lot, but it is worth the effort uh, as it's create a great team spirit, work ethic, and most important, you will have an end product. So I believe, Priya, now it's my turn to introduce you as a guest. Priya is a, is a researcher at the Center for Small Modern Construction with me at Wisconsin University working on Industry 4.0. Priya, commencing her doctoral research with us, she worked for Indian construction, Grant Larson and Tobro for over five years in transportation infrastructure projects, such as highways, runway, and elevated corridors, and had a short stint with US space technology driven construction startup, Kitera. Today, she will uh, talk to us about her experience with Construction Hackathon 2019.
Thank you, Amir. It's always a pleasure talking about Constructathon because what an experience it was about me. So Constructathon 2019 was Australia's first ever construction hackathon that aimed to collaboratively solve industry-wide problems in a fast-paced environment. It had 141 industry challenges submitted and it shortlisted three. Number one was improving process by reducing paperwork. Two was making mental health an industry standard. And three was creating safer working environments with zero fatalities and serious injuries. So it brought together over 120 leading construction industry and technology bodies across the supply chain to innovate and collaborate. Uh, it was sponsored and endorsed by some of the biggest names in construction in Australia and was supported by Google Cloud and was held at their head office in Pyramid and we were lucky to meet in person at that time. Um, so during the two day hackathon, we identified that statistics related to safety on site remained frightening and reinforced that focus needs to be on changing the safety culture at construction sites. As a nation, we spend about more than 100 billion annually on prevention, insurance, and compensations. At the end of the day, we pitched our digital solution, OKMate, okay, that crowdsourced safety hazards and safety ratings from everyone on site, collated the data, and made it visible to everyone on site, notified the right people about the hazards and issues, and helped them address these more quickly. So our idea of changing safety culture by making safety more data driven won us the construct constructathon 2019 and we were awarded with a six week incubation to help uh, develop a clickable prototype with fusion labs, a global innovation consultant. So thanks Priya. I mean, in my experience with change, I spoke about cross disability teams. So that thing you would like, I mean, you have like another thing you would like to highlight in addition to that. Absolutely. And it's totally aligned to something Professor Linda said earlier. It's about iteration. So to, uh, to validate OKMate, okay, we iteratively worked on the viability, feasibility, and desirability model of structured innovation. Uh, we identified potential users and conducted several sets of uh, user interviews to understand exactly what they thought of a digital solution that crowdsources were for feedback. Uh, so when I say desirability, I'm asking myself the question, are we solving the right pain point? Exactly what Professor Linda said as a starting point. A test for desirability focuses on whether your solution is a nice to have solution or a must have solution for the customer, right? Feasibility, I ask myself, are we building on our core operational strengths? A test for feasibility measures the operational capabilities within the organization in terms of technology, their finances, branding, customer service, et cetera. And viability, I, is, we ask the question, does our solution contribute to long-term growth? So testing for viability asks, does our business model fit with the way our customers want to use and pay for our solution? So to conclude, iteration and doing this process over and over again in a loop and synthesizing the learning is our friend when using this model of structured innovation. And that's something I thought of sharing with the audience today. Thanks, Priya. I believe everyone here interested like uh, next, uh, next year to be, uh, to be uh, in person with Interchange and Construction Hackathon 2021. So we are now at the frag end of our collective sense making. I would like to remind everyone here that both our speakers today are on LinkedIn and you can connect them uh, and also me and Abrita on LinkedIn for more uh, innovative and collective sense making issues. In addition to that, to know more about such events, don't forget to follow the Center for Smart Modern Construction page on LinkedIn and Facebook for our upcoming events. Now, on behalf of the CIB student chapter, I would like to request our current president of the chapter, Budini, to present a vote of thanks. Thank you, Priya, Amar, and the panelists for the wonderful session. Summing up the live chat on collective sense making, I would like to thank Professor Srinath, the director of the Center for Smart Modern Construction, for joining with us today to welcome the guests. Also, Professor shared his expertise on the potential of the blockchain technology in managing educational aspects. This is definitely a great starting point for blockchain related celebrations. We are looking forward for those. And also, I was thrilled to hear how you decoded the meaning of the university education to be learning to live in the universe. I had never heard of it before. 
with these specific aspects of peer, peer learning. So thank you for your encouragement and we are truly honored to have you here, Professor. And it is interesting how Linda and Natasha both shared their views on the design thinking, resilience through thought leadership. At times like this, where all leaders play a pivotal role in taking quick decisions to face the fast changing nature of any industry, today's fireside chat is quite trendy and relevant. My key takeaway from today's chat are enormous. First, I would like to note how Professor Linda mentioned the impact of the global pandemic, particularly to the education sector in Australia. Flexible, fully online modes of education have changed the game from traditional thinking to insist anyone and everyone to think like entrepreneurs. Most of the products in the current context have been focused on one single question. What would a startup do? Yes, we all are back to basics and it is a matter of time for us to rise back to a better normal from the new normal. Thank you for your valuable ideas, Professor Linda. Moving on to Natasha and uh, how she highlighted how being the CEO of your own career is extremely important to be more optimistic at times like this. One statement said by Natasha sticked in my mind, that is to be happy in whatever the career you are in. I think that should be the ultimate purpose of our lives, no matter where you are or what you are doing. Also, every problem has a solution and we just need to find the correct perspective to look at the problem. A different angle will always help. Thank you, Natasha, for sharing these creative thoughts and excellent examples with us. Moving to on to the speeches by my fellow colleagues. Amar has always been a design thinker and it is heavily reflected in his speech, his uh, uh, activities done in the interchange and his teaching and the way he looks at any issue. Your speech was inspiring for me to change my thinking patterns too. Thank you, Amar. And Priya, I remember the day you all won well, you all won Constructathon. That was one year back. And the learning process you all went through while incubating the tiny idea of OKMate OK to make it to a business prototype. I'm pretty sure those brainstorming sessions, pitching sessions and whatnot was extremely helpful in shaping your career. Lastly, I'm grateful for the ever more inspiring past and present executive committee of the CIB student chapter. Thank you very much, Kasun, for all your hard work behind the screens and behind the scenes. And Amar, thank you for your excellent ideas. We are so glad to have you in the team. Finally, Priya, this is a big thank you for all your thinking efforts and steering the CIB student chapter to where we are today. Thank you all for joining with us. See you again at our next inspiring event. Thank you, thank you so much, Buddhi. That was really a great summing up and you do this perfectly each time. Uh, thank you everybody for joining Collective Sense Making. See you again soon. And thank you, Amir, for being a perfect co-host. Thank you all. Thank you, Bria. Signing off and good night from Sydney. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend.